First of all, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you guys for coming out for the webinar tonight on warming up your gymnast. And uh, first things first, I want to get started with is I just want to say thank you to one of our sponsors for tonight, Tumble Track. They've been amazing helping us just get these things up and, and they're a very supportive company. And if any of you guys haven't been around James yet from Tr Tumble Track, if he hasn't been to your gym yet, make sure you get a hold of him because he came out to my wife's gym and they just, they spent a whole bunch of time there just, just helping out the girls, working with them. And I'm sure boys too, if you have boys in your gym. So that's a really cool thing. So just want to send a quick shout out to Tumble Track. So uh, before we get going. But first of all, here's for your sure. host for tonight. And uh, my name is Dr. Joshua Eldridge. And Dr. Dave Tilly is uh, on board too. But um, you've probably seen these people before. And they're definitely not Dave and I. We're definitely not this handsome. But it brings up a good point. <laughs> That I want to, that I kind of want to jump into with the webinar is not everything we see in the gym is what it seems. So we don't always, what what's there is kind of smoke and mirrors somewhat. And just because a gymnast can mm -hmm. perform doesn't mean that everything's right on the inside. So um, what do you think about that, Dave? That's a, that's a fantastic point. Uh, I think some conversations you have I have had have centered around this and I think uh, just because the overall picture looks good there's a lot of potential things that can be um, I guess not so great uh, you know either with their movement or their bodies and taking care of themselves and you know obviously psychologically is a big one too but you know if things can look great on the outside from a, either a most skill performance like just because you land on your feet you know you have to consider that not always is it everything okay you know there's a lot of stress going through the body and I think keeping that in the back of your mind can do a definitely a big a wonder to keeping your eyes open about things going on in your gym, you know. For sure. And and so there's a couple things that, you know, at home we talk about recovery and we talk about nutrition, which I know a lot of you have been on our webinars before about those. But once they get to the gym, the warm up is kind of where it starts in the gym. And a good warm up is going to prepare the body for what's about to happen in the gym. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go over the warm up and we're going to talk a lot about this and hopefully give you guys at home and in the gym right now some practical stuff that you can implement right away. But the deal is is that we can't possibly go into detail about everything we're going to talk about tonight cuz we just don't have enough time. We're going to spend about half an hour 45 minutes. So at the end of this, I want to give you guys if that's okay with you a resource where you guys can can go to and get more about this. So I hope that sounds like a good plan to you. But we're going to jump right in, then we'll give you that resource at the end. So so what does that mean to, to warm up and to prepare the body, and how do we do it? So Dave, if you want to jump in and just kind of tell us a little bit about what we do during a warm-up and what's the purpose. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, we you know we want to use the warm up as a time to you know in my eyes really just prepare the gymnast body for the training session. You know, you use a you want to make sure that it is you know slowly ramped up to you know getting warm. So increasing your body temperature is a big one. Um, you want to be moving and all that. And then you know a big one for me is you want to make sure you know the brain kind of rules the road with uh, a lot of movement, human movement and things like that. So you want to make sure you. Uh, prepare the body for very complex movement patterns that are going to happen in gymnastics. I think that we uh, get accustomed to looking at how easy things look on TV or how really talented gymnasts can just make things look, you know, piece of cake, you know, double back, full in, whatever it should be, big release move. But those are very complex, and I think that you use the warm up to kind of rehearse and try to prep the brain to get ready to move and be quick and agile and uh, you know respond to things because. It's a lot going on at a, at a fast pace, so if you just kind of jump in from you walk in the door and you toss your bag down and then you just you know run a little bit and then you do a couple of can stands and a couple of things there and then you just kind of jump right into an event, you know I don't think that's a really good uh, slow ramp and kind of tune up for the, the brain to get used to. So I think the main point for a woman for me is to get the whole brain body connection ready to go, um, and then kind of similar on that is. I guess this concept of grooving a motor pattern, although it sounds really cool, uh, <laughs> like I noted to, the brain really thinks in, in patterns. You know, it thinks in movement. It, it oftentimes doesn't think in individual muscles. So um, I think that we want to try to rehearse and, and get the body ready to do 
movement patterns that it's going to experience during training, right? So uh, a squat landing, you know, we squat when we land. So we want to rehearse that squat. We jump on two legs and one leg. We want to rehearse that single leg squat a little bit, the double leg squat, uh, all the way up to, you know, just moving your hip in a certain range of motion or in a certain, you know, uh, dynamic kind of activity that's going to be similar to what you might see for a leap or a jump on beams or, um, and then also just kind of getting all the body parts to kind of work together. So getting the individual joints to work, but then getting them to coordinate function between it. So improving motor patterns just means kind of rehearsing movements you're going to use later in the, in the rest of your training schedule, whether it be basics or just human movement, basically. All right. And then I guess the last one, um, so we kind of touched on this a little bit, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, you're going to want to use a training session to work on skills or do some strength or some mobility and flexibility work. And you want to prepare the body to handle, you know, whatever training volume you're going to kind of throw at it. So if you've got a lot of routines to get ready for a meet or you're working on a lot of skills, uh, you want to get the body ready so it can kind of handle and accept those training demands. And that way it can respond favorably. You know, it can grab it and adapt to it, which is what we all want for our gymnasts. Absolutely. So, so here's some of the things that happen when we don't warm up. So, and we'll go through these kind of quickly so we can get in the meat of it. But of course we all know there's an increased chance of injury if we don't warm up. And that's been kind of shown from the, from all the way from elementary kids that don't warm up for PE class, right? They're more prone to getting injured. So another one, and this is a big one for, for our gymnasts is that it decreases their performance. So when you don't prepare the body for work properly, it's just going to put the body at, you know, it just doesn't have the ability to perform like it would if it's warmed up. And the the second or the third thing is that your gymnast isn't getting everything they can get out of being in the gym if you're not warming them up. So you're kind of cheating them out of their time and their potential. And, uh, you know, for me, that's a big one. When I look at now, this is kind of weird for me, but now I'm a, I'm a gym dad. So, and if, if coach champions on the line, she was going to come tonight. So welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm excited to have you here, but, uh, that's my, that's my daughter's new coach. But, um, you know, I want her to get the most out of it, but I want her to be safe and I want her to learn at the same time and, and develop the way that she should. So, um, you know, let's, let's just give them everything that they can get out of it. And my saying is that I always say to the gymnast and everyone else, if you don't have time to warm up, you don't have time to work out. So that's my, and I know Dave has that philosophy too in his gym. Definitely. Definitely. So here we go. So let's get practical. Dave's going to take over this because this is something that he developed in his gym. And I think this is really cool how, how he kind of developed this. And I've actually implemented this with a lot of my patients. And, and when I teach gymnasts, I always get into this first part. And so here we go. Getting a little practical. Go ahead, Dave. Sure. So I guess um, growing up as a gymnast myself, coaching, you know, before I went to PT school and I had a lot of experience, my experience with a warm-up was to come in, you know, do some running drills, get the body warm, stretch out, and kind of just go for it, you know. But I think uh, there's a big, really important uh, kind of like a pre-warm-up, and then I made it this phase one where you want to kind of use uh, things like foam rollers and lacrosse balls or tennis balls to kind of get the tissue ready, right, to get, uh, you know, I guess the mechanisms of why foam rolling and those things don't really, we don't know exactly what it is, but it has been shown to uh, get some good range of motion increases and help assist somebody to get more mobile. Um, and also just kind of like we said, prepare the tissue to, to get warm and things like that. So I think that I, I was not really familiar with this. And uh, I think that my gymnasts have responded really well. They enjoy doing this part, but it's using, you know, foam rollers to, to kind of target certain areas that are really, kind of, I guess, chronically or typically uh, a little bit more um, hard to get warmed up in, in gymnasts. So if you think about the example I explain with a lot of my gymnasts is if you think about typical form posture for a gymnast of being straightening your knees, squeezing your legs together, and pointing your toes, you know, so your the tissue on the front of your leg, the quad that extends your knee straight, and then your uh, groin or adductor tissue in the middle that squeeze your legs together, and your calf muscles, which point your toes, those three areas are just more prone on a gymnast to become a little bit more restricted and maybe get you know overused a lot. So we want to really pay, pay special attention to those because uh, if they're going to always be used, we want to always take care of them. And the opposite kind of those three motions of straightening your knees, squeezing your legs together, and pointing your toes is legs a little bit apart, bending your knees, and then landing with your toes up, which is kind of a part of a really good squat. 
So we want to make sure that we kind of pay special attention to those tissues that if it's the reverse and we need that good squat, we want to make sure things are going well and those tissues are good. So in a, in a short, uh, short thing is that we don't really know why it works totally yet, but we, it does seem to help get gymnasts more mobile and also take care of some of the chronically overused tissue. So in the top right-hand corner, this is just a gymnast rolling out kind of her middle back, and then uh, it's kind of hard to see, but she would be extending back a little bit over that uh, foam roller uh, just to kind of work on the middle part of her spine that tends to sometimes get a little bit uh, stuck rounded forward in a gymnast. And then the one below that is one of my gymnasts kind of getting under her arm and some of her lat tissue, uh, some of the other areas around her shoulder blade. Um, that with a lot of bars, a lot of swinging, do a lot of pull-ups, you know, we work on a lot of strength for the arms that that area can get pretty restricted and if we don't take care of that, they that's going to really deal, you know, kind of affect how well they can get their arms over their head. So that's important for a good back handspring or swinging giants and things like that. So we want to take care of that. And then the bottom left, I think is a video actually, but it's just one of my gymnasts rolling out her the front of her legs uh, and her quads and things like that because, uh, again, the area gets pretty tight. Hip flexion is another big one. We talked about calves, uh, some of the uh, underarms when we talked about. So I just kind of put this in the warm-up before they ever start jumping on the floor or running around because I think it's really good to warm the tissue up and get things ready to go. And I know a lot of people uh, from the strength conditioning world all the way to physical therapy support that it's really good to use kind of before you start going to run around. So I guess that's where I started it, and the girls really like it. They find that it helps a lot. Uh, definitely if they're sore from a hard workout, it's really good to do and hop on for a couple minutes, um, kind of go through all the, the kind of head-to-toe scenario just before you jump in and just start running around the gym. And one of the things, Dave, um, for this is that that we don't necessarily have to go for, you know, like you were saying, just a couple minutes. We don't have to go for hours on the foam roller, so it's not necessarily like a massage session. They're just gently warming up. And, why, and I don't know, um, maybe you can go to what you do, but what I always tell my, my athletes too is maybe three up and three down, and that's it. So just enough sure. to get the tissue moving. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, to piggyback that point, it's not a chat session. You know, sometimes my girls are a victim of sitting there and looking like they're rolling out and talking about what the newest uh, Twitter feed said or things like that. So they have to pay, pay attention to it. You know what I mean? That's important. But also, similar on that, yeah, I don't think you need to do it for hours. Uh, I think. Uh, from what I've studied and researched that, you know, it, it can have a pretty good effect if you just do a quick one. And then also a very important point is that you don't need to push hard. It doesn't have to hurt. Uh, I think there's a big misconception out there that you have to really dig into your quads or if it hurts, a kind of no pain, no gain. And this is a uh, topic for a different time, but some of the research has moved more towards the fact that it's maybe more about what our brain perceives with the muscle being tight and, uh, you know, more than neurological changes than actually changing the tissue itself. So the thought that if you push harder, you can change the tissue, uh, I guess that's being debated in the research. I don't have a perfect answer for why, because like I said, we don't know yet. But um, I have still seen really good success with going lighter, uh, very easy, and not causing pain. So I think that's important for people to know when they're doing this. It's very easy to jump on a hot spot and kind of want to push hard. But uh, I, I tend to tell my gymnast to resist from that, because I think sometimes we work backwards. But like I said, that's a, that's a topic for a different time. Yeah, so we're looking at this stuff. So just getting these body parts and maybe we're going to get to another part specialization in a little bit. But, you know, you're looking at maybe one or two minutes, three minutes on right. here at most. So right. it's been a little bit of time on this. but Under five minutes. Yeah, for sure. So then let's go on to this. And this is something really cool that uh, Dave kind of taught me as well that I've added into my core activation type stuff, but breathing technique and how important it is. And go ahead from a therapy kind of kind of – Spotlight, Dave. Go ahead. Let us know what what goes on with breathing and kind of go into to how to do it. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, breathing is a huge topic. Uh, we could have a separate couple webinars on this. But in a nutshell, one of the really good um, effects of breathing is that people tend to have uh, an abnormal breathing pattern where they use their neck muscles a bit too much. So if everyone's in their chair, take the uh, super super deep breath as much as you can. Breathe all the air in your lungs. And what you might feel is that your shoulders kind of rise and your back kind of arches, your neck kind of tenses up, and you feel like your chest is lifting up towards your head. And that's not the best breathing pattern because it doesn't really use your diaphragm, which is a, a muscle attached to your ribs that helps to expand your lungs. So now what I want you to do is put your hands kind of on your rib cage, like kind of hula hoop. Your thumbs are towards the back, your fingers in the front. And when you breathe in, I want you to push your hands out, kind of push out against your hands and make your belly kind of move out more than your chest moving. So go deep breath in. And you can feel your ribs kind of expand and your belly open up. And that has been shown to have a little bit more uh, action to use the diaphragm. And that's really important because if you're breathing with your uh, chest muscles and your neck muscles, it's not 
the most effective, but it's also uh, overusing the neck and probably causing some tightness in there. So by using your diaphragm and kind of expanding through your ribs, you can teach the, uh, the core to use that muscle to breathe properly. And then also the diaphragm is a very important muscle that uh, forms the top of what's the kind of the core canister and helps to really make a, a solid uh, core stability or core stiffness when you need it for skill work. So I always have my gymnasts start every workout uh, on their back. They put one hand on their belly, one hand on their chest. I think there's a picture coming up soon, so don't worry. But mm -hmm. I have them just take a couple deep breaths in and try to feel their belly move. Their chest will move a little bit, but the, the motion should be coming more so from the lower part. And uh, another really good side point to this is that breathing properly and uh, using your diaphragm and getting nice, slow, deep breaths can sometimes help kind of take you out of a really kind of wound up, uh, ramped up state in your nervous system. So if you're really kind of maybe stressed out or uh, you have a meet coming up as like a gymnast is and they're kind of all worried and concerned, if you're always in that kind of wound up state, it's not really good for you uh, in terms of your health but also uh, how you can use your core because we want to be able to kind of go from a, a relaxed state all the way to a really excited state back and forth. So if they're constantly in this wound up state, it's not really good for them for a variety of different reasons. But uh, anywhere from calming the nervous system down before you work out and warm up, uh, it can help with your mobility by breathing properly. Um, it can also help to just get you in a better position before you start doing some core work. And uh, I think it's really good to, like we said, just get some of the proper core work going on first before we start to do the rest of our uh, core activation. So uh, is that enough for breathing? Was that good? Yeah, no, that's perfect. And that's one of the things that I've been implementing in is what I'll do is I'll do one set of breathing with my with my athletes before they do you know just maybe three sets of the of the tight core exercise so just yeah. just something to kind of get them get them thinking about hey this is how i breathe and how i relax so so right. and, it, it's really amazing very important the, the diaphragm muscle that we're talking about has a role to help your uh, respiration and gas exchange but it also has another function to help with the core it's two separate functions and if you you have to learn to do both at the same time to be able to use the diaphragm to tighten with the core but still be able to breathe because uh, if, if the situation comes up and your brain decides that the breathing uh, and gas exchange is not the best and you need to get air in, it's going to choose that over the core. It will, it will sacrifice the core being stable to help you breathe better. So mm -hmm. learning to do tight core with good breathing or all these exercises with good breathing is, yep. is absolutely critical. So that's a, that's a really good time to rehearse it. For sure. And then and then we get into these other ones and these can be kind of specific or they can be as a as part of a program that you work in. But but the dead bug is just where they lie on their back and they kind of do the cross crawl on their back. And then the cross crawl is when you're on all fours. So what do you mm -hmm. guys call it in PT, Dave? Uh, bird dog. Bird dog. So bird dog <laughs> or cross crawl. So there's there's a million different ways to talk about it, but it's just one where you're using both sides of your body. You're you're working on gently keeping that core tight and your hips level and then rolling se sequences. And this is gonna sound, we don't have time to get into rolling all the way today, but I had a patient the other day, Dave, who was, he was, um, no, you know, I take that back. It was, a, it was a female and a female athlete and she was touching her knees only. And so, you know, we walked and we're gonna talk about the SFMA and FMS in just a little bit. Bending over and touching yeah, her knees. she was pretty yeah. much, she was much barely, you know, barely bending over like Dave's saying. and then. And so we just went through that and found out that she had more of a motor control issue. We got her on the ground rolling, doing a couple of rolls. And that's something that, that Dave and I can do a video about too. But um, she did. I think I have it on my website. Oh, nice. Good. It's over at hybridperspective.com. But then yep. she did, I think we had her do five both ways. So um, I think it was a lower extremity uh, roll and hopped up both hands flat on the ground. It was the coolest thing ever. So I was I was sold at that point forward. But that's yeah. just another thing that you can do. And, and like I said, we've got other videos about that rolling sequences. And and I know on on um, gymnast care we talk about cross crawl and and um, tight core and dead bug and all those things. So and then toe down landing position, which is just a, a a core strength maneuver where they go toe ball heel, just working on that landing position, but not so much as a as like a warm up exercise just to to groove the motor patterns of landing properly. Right. So, and then we can move over here and just show you a couple of these. This is how, um, another shout, shout out to Breezy, who's, who's our, our star, our star model for the book. But, um, if she had her left hand on her belly and her right hand up on her chest, that's what we're talking about. And this is how I just have my patients do it in this position. 
they take three yeah. big deep breaths, but only their belly hand can move when they do it. Yeah. So in that tight core position, and then you can see her doing the cross crawl too, just keeping that back nice and flat, working on gently tighten that core while you breathe, doing the belly breaths and do that. So those are right. two examples. So now in this warm up, we spent a lot of time on this, but we've we've uh, we're up to like four minutes on yeah. uh, four or five minutes on your warm up. So this isn't the majority of it. This is just prepping the body. These are just phase one and two. And then the next one, which is what we kind of talk about for the warm up, is preparing the body to accept load. And this is what I've done a lot of times with with our, our gymnasts. And there's a lot of information here. And it doesn't have to be this much every day. But a lot of these movements are the movements they're going to be doing in gym. And I really like the trampoline stuff. So talk a little bit, Dave, about what you do with your girls in the gym. Sure. So, uh, like I said, we come in and they do their foam roll work, their breathing stuff. Uh, they go through their uh, basic core work. And then we start with uh, just walking up and down the floor, just real basic, kind of the middle section. So the neck rolls, you know, nice and slow and controlled. They do big arm circles, slow and controlled. Uh, they do wrist circles, controlled, kind of palms up, palms down. Uh, they work on just basic kind of motions of their individual joints, and then they, after probably a couple minutes of that, once we've gone from neck to shoulder to wrist to elbow to uh, a little bit of hip stuff, they do hip openers. We'll grab their heel on one side and kind of do like a figure four, or like they'll pull it towards their chest. Uh, pulls up on their toe where they reach for the ceiling. Um, they do uh, a little bit of ankle rolls, things like that. But that's all before they start running and. Uh, Definitely give a shout out. I think both of us should to Brian Picard, uh, who has definitely um, kind of helped us acclimate some of our thought process around the order and things like that. He taught me a lot about some of this stuff, so I want to definitely give him credit. But um, that kind of not running right away concept I got from him saying that maybe we should prep the joints a little bit more and, and get things moving before we just kind of get off there and run. So we do that all for a couple of laps, go head to toe, and then we start out with a jog. Uh, where we do regular jog, high skip, sachets, butt kickers, high knees, you know, down and back, maybe two laps. Uh, I think all in all, that takes like five minutes to go, three to four minutes maybe to go through that all the way down, back and forth. And they have it in just lines. So all the girls line up and use the whole floor. So we have them go uh, the running drills back and forth, skips, and then uh, it kind of slows down after they've run for five or so minutes, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and they start going through, I guess, more dynamic activities, dynamic rolling stretches across the floor. So uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head where it is. So maybe some like walk out to pike stretches, warm their ankles up, press their shoulders open, uh, go down to a seal stretch, you know, lower down, they'll do a forward roll. So like it's like maybe a couple seconds on transition of skills getting through their ranges of motion, and then they'll kind of roll so the next line of, you know, seven people on the floor can go. Um, and that kind of goes, there's a bunch of different stuff. I mean, there's uh, all the way from the basic ones where they just – do shoulder movements, kind of leaning their uh, arms out in the kind of like a, a T position, stretching their pecs on both sides. Uh, steel stretches, they roll through to their splits on both sides. They do uh, some like active hip kicks. So if you're in a split, we'll say we're on your right leg split, you would roll over onto your back and you would hold your leg close to your head and you would kind of do scissor switches. So like drop one leg, grab the other leg, drop leg, one leg, like leg lowers, and then they would kind of roll down the floor to their next one. I forget where we got that from, but it's a really good one. With split stuff, kind of not just pushing into a split, but working on raising your leg in a split pattern. So I guess that's a difference. You're not just kind of pushing into it, but you're actively trying to bring your leg up to your head uh, that way. So uh, some pike roll throughs, the straddles, pancakes, kind of typical things you would do, but it's not really like we sit still and, and push, you know, or do just sit for two minutes or things like that. It's always moving, you know, because we just increase that temperature of the body. We've done so much work to get the body moving. We don't want to just sit in one static position. So it's a constant flow of movement, you know, between joints and motions and shoulders are moving, elbows are moving, uh, ankles are moving. We kind of go through a huge, uh, I guess, back and forth section for about 10 minutes. Um, and I guess by that point, we're probably from the the, day, the second they walked in the gym to that right there is probably like 20 minutes, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that kind of summarizes all the stuff on this page. Yep. And then uh, one of the questions that we just had from Lauren, and thanks for that question, Lauren is that is it okay to warm up on the tumble track and that's where i kind of get in the trampoline and i personally i love the tumble track in order to do some some non uh weight bearing type i mean it's weight bearing but it's it's not as as harsh as some of the other things so if you're going to be warming up split jumps and things like that what i like to do is 
I do, I do three times down in one rotation and I have them just start off really small and then work yeah. it up into bigger yeah, ones. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. Nope. That was it. So, so yeah, I think it's great working on those motions on the tumble track to, to build up to it so that they don't hop on the tumble track. And if you're doing split jumps or, or straddle jumps, you're not just, you know, bringing your legs all the way up past 180 degrees, you know, where they're touching up top above the head, you're, you're right. slowly working it up. And right. And going. I think there's a variety of different ways, tumble track, but I think the biggest kind of takeaway message is not going from cold turkey to a full out sprint where jumping and bounding right away. You know, sure. I think there's a, a slow ramp up um, kind of just to get you. Tumble track's great. Tramp's good. Uh, I think personally as a coach from my coaching eyes, it's kind of hard sometimes to keep things fluid and moving as it tends to be, you know, five or ten girls standing in line. So I, I would rather all of them be somewhat moving and have shorter rests in between. So not that we don't do trampoline, we do, and we do tumble track, but I kind of try to survey that if we have a huge group, it's kind of, I don't want to spend all time waiting, you know. We, yep. we might do some side stations on the way back, some dynamic rolls and stuff on the way back. That's been really good to help. Yeah, and that's a big thing for a lot of our a lot of our gyms is, you know, you guys are looking at some of the stuff and you're like, I can never implement all that. Just start slow with it. So just start right. slow with some of the stuff and start building it into your program. You know, you don't have right. to do it all tomorrow, but this is kind of what you're looking at is is when your girls warm up eventually it's going to look like they're 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 working out but it starts slow and they build up to it and it's going to just be a normal part of their day is their right. warm up. Right. And it's and also Oh, go ahead. I was going to say from a coaching point of view my recommendation of what worked for me is rather than me stand in front and try to explain 30 gymnasts the whole warm up, uh, I added in things day by day little by little so we would do you know, they had an older woman before I had started with the gym, and me and my boss sat down with a couple of the other coaches and said maybe we can tweak this a little bit. But we had to learn things slowly, one by one. And really important is I think most gyms have kind of a, I guess, a, a group of older girls who kind of lead their team and they kind of help guide the little ones along the way. So if you have a, you know, a, a bunch of deer and headlight looking at you from the little girls, I think before you roll out a new warm up, um, take the, you know handful of older girls who are able to process it, you know, girls that are maybe in high school or juniors and seniors that can responsibly lead the group and help them, teach them in depth the warm-up maybe on, a, on one day, and that way when you do start the warm-up, they can kind of help, you know, help people kind of move along, and it's not more of a shock and awe fact, because if you get them on board and they understand it, they can kind of help work through the problems versus you running around at 10 different girls trying to fix their position and, oh, roll this way, and, oh, you hit somebody else in line and all that. Yeah, for sure. And, um... Yeah, I think you guys can can definitely implement something like this in your gym. It just takes a little while, and you got to get all the coaches on board. Or or if you're here's another one too, Dave. That that maybe that we didn't think about too much, or that or that might be out there. It might be there might be parents out there as well that oh sure yeah. you know prior to maybe their gym just as an end of this and right right. I think that some of this can be done at home. Or in the car on the way, like warming up your wrists, warming up your neck, warming up your ankles, doing, you can't really do hip mobility until you get to the gym. But, you know, if you have a couple minutes while you're at home prior to going to the gym, I think this is great to start implementing some of this in the house. Yeah, absolutely. There's things you can do in the car. And even if you go, you know, I think pending school and having a rush there, I think a lot of people can get there just even 10 or five minutes early. And, you know, they can have their gymnasts do a couple things on their own before they have to line up for, you know, our gym is, you know, 5.30, toes in the line, be ready to warm up. But a lot of the girls come there early and, you know, have things that they, they do beforehand that are kind of individual to them or that they've learned and have been really helpful to them. So you can always kind of do your own thing a little bit before you need to be ready to line up with your coach. For sure. And that kind of gets into our next point is, is so that's the plan. And, and, and realistically, if you're there for four hours, we'd like to see it, you know, somewhere about, like you said, from the time they walk in the door and they may get there five or 10 minutes early and some of that stuff can be done beforehand. And mm -hmm. then for an hour and a half practice. So that's what my daughter practices is an hour and a half, you know, 15, 20 minutes adapting some of this to what they're doing because, uh, you know, my seven year old who's practicing an hour and a half, two times a week doesn't necessarily right. have the stress that a level 10 is going to have with a double back. Definitely. So, so, you know, we want to adapt that for her, for her output, like we talked about before. So she might need to do just a little bit less, but we still want to get her body warmed up. Oh, one of the other things too, Dave, that I was thinking about during, 
you know, when we're watching them warm up, this is a great time to, to observe for our coaches out there. It's a great time to ob observe to see how their nutrition is, how they're responding. Are they sick today? So you can keep eyes on them during this time and get a lot of information yeah. from your gymnast. You know, if they're, if yeah. they're huffing and puffing and, and, you know, you talk to them, Hey, you know, I, your gymnast says I didn't eat anything today. It may not be a great day for them to practice. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, the, the idea of kind of scanning your team as a coach, you know, this is me stepping out of more so PT shoes and into my coaching coaching shoes is just like, you know, that 20 minute window and you can really gauge where people are at, you know, someone who's normally real cheery comes in, bounces around and is happy to be there, you know, maybe they're, they're you know, a little, little slow moving and something's going on. You can ask them those questions about, uh, Hey, how's, how's this feeling? Or, you know, what's going on? Cause it's not, I mean, nutrition obviously is super important hydration, but also sometimes they're just, super stressed out, you know, the kids in high school or kids in there and, you know, they just might be really overwhelmed and stressed out and that makes a big, a big impact on their training volume and what you're going to throw at them if they're, you know, having a lot going on. And so I think that's a really important step to use the time to see who's doing what. And also, uh, from, from my point of view, I guess now more PT is that if I know somebody has, uh, undergone rehab and recovery of an injury, that's my tune. That's my check-in time. And I ask girls who once had injuries or who are recovered and getting back into it, like, Hey, how's it feeling? How's the ankle? You know, neck still feeling good. You're still doing your homework. Like, do you have any problems with the stuff I gave you at home? Or somebody comes from another PT. Sometimes they choose that. Like, hey, you're doing your stuff. Your physical therapist asks. Like, you're making sure you're tuning up because you can kind of communicate with them and just keep constant tabs on where they're at. If you're in the middle of competition season, the volume's getting high and they have a meet. Like, you know, how you feeling? You guys good? You all right? Like, anybody got any problems? Like, because if somebody's like kind of hiding to the corner and then like maybe they do a couple jumps and they don't really jump, you got to ask them. Say, hey, what's going on? Is your ankle okay? Because they're not going to tell you. You know, some of them are just want to train and they're going to kind of try to gut through it, but we got to kind of take a, a proactive approach to that in the coaching domain. For sure. All right. So we had a, a question that came up about the foam rolling and what, sure. what uh, Elise asked was, how do you know that it's working for first? And the second one was that she was under the impression that if you find a tight spot, you know, you should really dig into that with a spiky ball. Uh huh. So the first part, uh, how is it working? Uh, great question for both of those, actually, super great. Um, the first one is that you know it's working. Um, I usually do a pre and post test. So when I have somebody, uh, I mean, if we're, if we're going to change like a movement or like get something a little bit more flexible and more mobile, um, you know, I might have somebody sit down at the wall and reach their arms back over their head to see if they can touch their hands flat to the wall. And if they can't, you know, maybe I'll have them go on a foam roller and work under their arm, get a lacrosse ball on there, get over the foam roller, bend backwards, and then I'll retest in between those things, because usually if you if it's going to make a difference, it doesn't, like we said, take 10 minutes to do, uh, you can kind of pre and post test and you'll know that maybe it's making a difference and then it just takes some, you know, repetition and kind of more, you know, days, uh, there's a lot more to make it stick long term, but I always try to use a movement baseline before and after or if somebody, you know, feels stiff when they do a split and they roll out their hamstrings, their groin and their hip flex from the back leg and they feel they can get lower and better and it feels smoother then you know I think that it's something you want to continue to pursue and I guess you know it's working uh, more scientifically it's very hard to prove it's working you know by how we think it is and I guess that kind of leads to the second question is um, that's kind of a bigger topic for uh, another time we can get more into it I'd be happy to but uh, there's just some research available that shows um, that the reason that foam rolling works is much more neurological about how your brain perceives uh, you know, the tightness in your muscle and much more about the fact that when we roll on it, we're affecting the, uh, I don't want to get technical, I like to mumbo jumbo, but we're affecting the receptors in the muscles, which send a signal to the brain to maybe make the muscle relax, you know, so if that's the case and it's neurological, not so much of like we're changing the tissue or we're making the tissue looser or breaking up scar tissue, then um, the pain may not be needed. Um, and I can just tell you from a lot of experience that I, I used to fall into that category where I would be really aggressive and I sometimes found that the gymnasts were working backwards where if you push too hard, the brain and the nervous system gets a little concerned and doesn't know if it likes that it all gets threatened and it kind of protects itself. So I've gone super light and had the same effects testing someone's moving before and after. So um, I guess it just really comes down to the, the research available uh, on what they think is, is happening when you do foam roll. So, uh, there's definitely some tissue changes. There's a lot of other research that shows about blood flow and stuff, but the reason that range of motion stays better, I guess, is is just getting debated in some of the science. So uh, type back in if that doesn't. For sure. All right. Thanks, Dave. So, um, um, and she said, interesting. Thank you. And that goes right along with 
another webinar that Dave and I are going to do on stretching. So that's coming up. That's why Dave's kind of kind of hinting at some of this stuff because I told him he couldn't he couldn't get into it too much. But <laughs> he it's, held the reins back on me. Yeah, and <laughs> because we got to remember that a lot of this stuff, especially when we're talking about resetting the neurological system, which is what we're doing in gymnastics, or that's what we're trying to do, is that it's it's a process, not an event. So we got to remember right. that this takes time. It's just that's why gentle stretching works better than than hardcore over splits and someone that can't can't even do a you know can barely hold their leg up so so just that's throwing that out there we're going to get into that and we're excited to so but um this one's more about warm-up so i kind of told dave we got to hold off on that for now but we're getting there so um here's another big one that that i'm i'm really excited to that i've been doing a lot of work in lately is end of individualizing plans for for gymnast and a lot of this stuff at the beginning can be can be customized for your gymnast and that's some of the stuff that uh that i know dave's been into for a while and i've been into but what do you think about that dave uh yep so i think the first important point to know about this is that when you start to get into uh really breaking down someone's movement and kind of i guess testing them to see what's the main problem because there's a lot of different possible answers for why somebody can't put their arms overhead you know be, having quote unquote tight hips or tight shoulders can really be a lot of things if you if you, even just the simple act of raising your arm up over your head to get to your ear there's many many things that could be you know hung up on the way or causing that to be not going over your head well so with that in mind if there is someone who is just you know you've tried some things and you've read some articles and you've tried some things it hasn't really stuck it hasn't really worked uh, we we don't really want you to try to assess that person or treat that person um, you know, the best thing to do is find somebody who has a really good movement healthcare background and kind of work as a team. Maybe get them screened, have them come to the gym and screen your gymnast, or um, take them to get seen by them because they can really hone in on the one thing that may be causing it, or a couple things that may be causing it, rather than you know trying all these different things. They call it a shotgun approach. You know, you don't want a shotgun approach. You'd rather really know your target and kind of aim at one spot and really know that where you're shooting at is good. So. Um, I think if you do want to go for this route, team up with healthcare or someone who has a really good movement background because it's just it saves a lot of headaches. That's really what it comes down to. It saves a lot of headaches and they can really understand what's going on. But with that being said, um, you can kind of fine uh, fine tune a warm up or a pre warm up to be according to what the gymnast needs for their own individual movement profile. Everybody sitting in this webinar has their own movement issues or previous injuries or the brain and the neurological system compensates or moves in an in in absolutely staggering, amazing way. So the way your body responds to certain things that are wrong, it, it changes in all sorts of ways. So that being said, if you can movement screen them and figure it out, you can kind of tailor it to what they need to work on, um, You know, especially if they've had a previous injury. That's a big one. If they have a previous injury, their pre-warm-up should be specific to what they did uh, at the end of their rehab and what their uh, home program kind of composes of as a maintenance program. So I think that that's an area that I've been working a lot in, and I think that coaches have a huge role to help implement that because if they can, you know, be encouraging of that gymnast to maintain uh, something that's previously been rehabbed or recovered, or they know that that gymnast has, you know, an issue with their shoulder flexibility or an issue with their ankle being really stiff, they need to be able to, you know, tailor those things specifically to them versus a group warm-up may not get everybody because you have some gymnasts who fall in the category of very, very naturally flexible and they probably don't need to be doing a lot of mobility work. They need more control work or they shouldn't spend a ton of time stretching out a lot versus the other end of the spectrum is the gymnast who is a little bit more tight and a little bit more stiff, I guess tight is a bad word, a little bit more prone to lose their mobility and may need to work a little bit harder on that department. They, they aren't going to benefit too much from just you know a blanket program. They need their own individual uh, kind of assessment, I guess, if that's. Yep, and that's where that's where we kind of touched on it before. But some of the professionals that you can come in to help you are are certified in like the functional movement screen or the selective functional movement assessment. So those are yep. things that can really help out your athletes and and you as coaches. If you guys haven't heard of those, you need to look into it because it's something that as a coach you can get certified as a as a functional movement person. And, and be able to screen your athletes. So that's what it's there for is for you to be able to screen. And then if they do, if you do want more information, you can get, get, you know, a professional involved too. But that's something that, that can really help out your gym. And, and like Dave said, personalize it. And, and he hinted around this, 
but just to come out and say it, the the most what's going to make your athlete more most likely to have an injury is that they've had the injury in the past. So exactly. So if they're going to get injured, it's most likely because they've already had that injury in the past. And and you guys have all seen it before. The the kids that have one injury, they've they've had it before. So um, yeah. So that's yeah. kind of what. The research is supportive oh, of that. Yeah. I was going to say the the research is supportive of that. A biggest risk factor is a previous injury, maybe not the same one, but some of the research in the gymnastics world shows that it's it's eye opening for me is that sometimes. A couple studies have showed up to upwards of 30 to 40 percent of injuries in gymnastics are re-injuries of old injuries, and they think it's either because of a, a return back to a sport that was too rushed or an inadequate rehab, but also maybe we didn't we didn't bridge that gap slowly and take care of their individual problems, um, you know, maybe like we should have. So I guess there's a lot of work to be done in that area for sure. For sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to get to a couple questions, but uh, here in a second. So give us about two seconds to to get to questions. But what's next? How do I learn more? And this is what I wanted to tell you guys about that Dave and I are going to be doing. We're going around the country and we're putting on these really cool clinics and they're called Gymnastics Revolution. And we're going to be doing it throughout the month of May and June. And we're going to be at these different locations the the last weekends in May and the first weekends in June. And we would love for you guys to come out and join us. And what we're this is one of our topics that we're going to be going over is the warm up. But we're going to be going through each. Elise, I love that, by the way. Sorry, she just said come to Australia. Dave and I <laughs> are there. <laughs> um, oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> but we're going to be coming out. And we're going to take each of these things that we talked about. Like how do you do a rolling pattern? We're going to go over that. We're going to go over how to do core control. But it's <laughs> – oh, and Aaron and Lauren, they want us to come to New Zealand. So New we're Zealand. definitely doing a, a South it. Pacific World swing. Tour. <laughs> nice. So, um, my, one of my best teammates is my best friends from uh, Sp- Springfield is from New Zealand. So, nice. Get the <laughs> nice. And maybe everybody on the webinar can join us. That'd be a good time. We'll just do a cruise down there and, and... <laughs> traveling roadshow on the cruise. Yeah, there you go. So, but yeah, so we're going to go over the warm up. We're going to be going over a whole bunch of other stuff in this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick this in our, in our, um, here's the website if you want more information about this. And, and so we're going to be going to these different areas. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about Dave's going to be going over specific things that they do with coaches uh, that he does as a coach to implement some of this stuff in. And then we're going to be talking about injury prevention, nutrition for coaches, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we're going to have some of our, our tumble track people are going to be there. It's just going to be a good time. And you're going to learn tons of information about not only protecting your gymnast from injury, but also about performance enhancing and how all this stuff can take your athletes to the next level. So we're excited to be bringing this to you and, and we're pretty much hitting all the different areas of the country. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited. I can't, I can't wait, man. I actually, we just had a bunch more people sign up today for the last two weekends. And, uh, I can tell you that I'm sitting down this weekend and putting a lot of, a lot of time into revamping the lectures to make them as, as best as I possibly can. I want to share Everything I've experienced in my coaching career and what's how the blend's been with PT, so I'm, I'm super pumped to be able to, you know, even learn more from you, Josh, but also just really give as much as we can to everybody who is able to attend. Yeah, and I just threw that where you can find more information about that end of our our chat box. So, um, yeah, we'd be we'd be really excited to meet all you guys, and so you can come and learn more about this and learn how to actually. You know, a little bit more about implementing it in the gym and and really protecting those athletes and taking them to the next level. So here we go. Let's get to some questions. And we've got some good ones. And I want to start off with this one. And it is from, let me find it here real quick. Oh, here it is from Lauren. And what Lauren says is, is what is the best type of warm up for recreational gymnasts? Is it okay to warm up by playing games? And that is awesome, Lauren, because absolutely, especially for those kids that are they're just getting into gymnastics and they're trying to figure it out. Games are a fantastic idea. And if you come up with five or six games, we would love for you to video it and shoot it over to us and we'll share it with our communities because I think that's fantastic. There was a whole lecture at that on Congress and at Region 6 when we were there last year when I was speaking. There was an entire lecture just on games for preschoolers and recreational kids that were both good for their you know body but also a great warm-up in different sections. So that's a, that's a huge one. Yeah, you could even throw in like um like tight core stuff, breathing exercises in there, rolling. 
So, and, and that's one of the things, yeah, one of the things for, that I think is really neat that Dave and I were talking about this week is that, is that a lot of times some of the moves that we do in gymnastics create dysfunction in our athletes. So, but it's not just gymnastics, right? It's every sport that you play where you do a repetitive motion. So, and for, for our gymnasts, I know you see a lot of our gymnasts with, with tight pecs and weak upper backs and they've got the rounded shoulder position, but there are things that, there are things that, you know, you can do in your warm up that just helps reset your athletes both physically and neurologically and, and can really give them an advantage. And to throw that in a game, if you could understand it at that level and put it into a game, that is, that's yeah, pretty high speed. They're awesome, man. You're, you're winning. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's really neat. And if you do come up, if you do put some of this stuff in it, like I said, I'd love for you to video it and shoot it over to us. I'll share it on gymnast care for, for our community. I know Dave would, would love to do it over there. I'm sure. Definitely. And Mike, I, we have tons of coaches in our gym who, you know, we have a, all the way from preschool all the way up to, you know, our optional gym. So I, I would happily share that with them and see how they enjoy it and then tape it and kind of spit it out to all of our, uh, all of our online users. Yeah. So, um, um, Josh asks, uh, I think you say it Hasanori. I hope that's how you say it. Um, but, uh, he's, he said that, uh, James from tumble track comes to your gym. He just wants his information. So I'll definitely get that. We'll definitely be sharing more about tumble track stuff and you can just shoot a message to him. I, I'm pretty sure whenever James is in the area, he loves to go to, to gyms. I hope he's on this, this call. And coming to the Ohio and he just told me uh, yesterday, he can't wait to come. Yeah. So, and he's a, he's a cool guy and, and they're all about per, you know, protecting gymnasts from injury and, and cheerleaders and martial artists, but they're the, the actual owner of tumble track. He does, he does some really cool research into, into tracking gymnasts movement and, and how many, how many reps can they do before injury? It's really, they're a cool company and we're, we're glad to team up with them. So let's Definitely. go down here. Um, I think, uh, so said along with this is from Elise again. She says along with Lauren's question, what about for your junior squad programs? Too young to follow a lot of structure, but will follow through with your more elite programs in years to come. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, yes, I can. I can touch on that one. So uh, this came up with our gym is that um, the warm up that I mean I I primarily coach in the optional team, so the warm up that I made for them was obviously more complex and had more components, things like that, and. The, uh, the level, the compulsory coaches and some of the junior coaches said that it's just, it's sometimes just too much. And I, I completely agree. I think that the best thing to do for that is to take the, uh, the more complex one and then maybe just draw out the more simpler, uh, but effective, uh, movements and things like that, that are still helpful, but they're not as many, you know, motions or patterns, or maybe they're not, uh, you know, really doing the in-depth breathing drill cause they don't really understand it, but maybe just like kind of a skeleton framework that still gets your basics and it still goes through all your splits and handstands and wrist ankle motions and stuff like that and uh, eventually can fill in to be, uh, as they grow and learn more and, and see the older girls do it or you teach them more, they can you know kind of morph into the more complex one because they've already had exposure to the basics, I guess you would say. I think all the warm-ups that are offered or uh, have a little bit more complexity to them can be broken down into just one or two simpler movements, you know, or just laps on the floor that aren't as complex uh, and then be build it upon and I'd be happy to I guess shoot you some uh, suggestions of things that the the coaches that are in the compulsory levels use in our gym that uh, mimic the warm-up that we have for the complex one but they're not as uh, I guess involved um, I think that answers the question <laughs> yeah and she just asked a follow-up she just said would you have them rolling so um, probably on the foam roller I, I imagine she's asking but um, gently, I would have my, my daughter definitely rolling at seven if she's, if she's being uh, gentle on it and not trying to mash her muscles. So, but I yeah, definitely yeah. do soft tissue on my, I definitely do soft tissue work on her, you know, low back just to, just to keep her a little bit more mobile and, and she just likes it. So, um, that's something that, that they'll get to where they enjoy it too. Yeah. I think that's a, a bit, I mean, I think, I, yeah, if she means the formal one, then yeah, you can start, I mean, cause you got to remember that from a very young age, they're in gymnastics, and the sport is is uh, changing their movement and body to adapt in a good way. But also at the same time, we have natural tendencies. You know, every sport has its own kind of things that are typical to happen with that athlete. You know, pitchers with shoulders and uh, swimmers with shoulders, and uh, you know things like that. So the sport creates adaption that we want, but at the same time, we have to maintain it and kind of manage it. So I, I 
wouldn't really be so concerned as long as, like you said, they're not killing themselves with it or doing things that are a little bit uh, maybe not warranted with it. Right. Yeah. And and by the way, everybody, Michelle from Tumble Track is is on tonight, so it's really cool to have her. And hello, Michelle. Oh, cool. It's been a little while, but yeah, if you have any questions specific for that, send them over. Um, so here is one. Well, so like here's one, one, a pretty good one. This is from Anna, and she says, "Can you speak to long-term adaptation of of gymnasts to the warm-ups as far as getting diminishing returns, and how often do you change them?" Uh, I think that one of the things is is that even though you know there's always with certain movements you end up getting diminishing returns, but you still have to prepare them for the movement that they're going to do in the gym. So, you know, prepare them neurologically and, and warming up and things like that. So you can always switch it up slightly and, and change the, the, the duration or time, um, uh, the amount, the reps, things of that nature as well, and change up the, the cycle in which they do them. So that way you don't necessarily get diminishing returns. That's what I'd say to that. What about you, Dave? You there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Did you... I don't know where I lost you guys on that one, but I think I cut out. Switching, switching it up if you're getting uh, diminishing returns. Yeah, so so switching up the reps, switching up the, the time, switching up where you're doing them within the warm-up. But we have to make sure that they're getting some of those movements to prepare their body. So what do you think about that? Um, so I think there's a component that she may be speaking to of also like how do you make uh, changes stick I think is something that uh, she may be hinting at too, like long-term changes maybe. Uh, in terms of your point, what you were talking about, yeah, you can always uh, introduce some more variability into the, the types of stretches they do. You know, as long as they're all centering around the same uh, movement patterns in my mind, I think. Like, so, for example, your hip extending back or bringing your leg back is really important, but there's a thousand different stretches and exercises and things like that you could do to encourage that motion. So, you know, you don't want to have the, the gymnast become so kind of, I guess, mundane and doing it over and over. I think consistency is important, but you can also toss in different things here and there or switch it up every once in a while. Um, I would just caution of, of doing that too much because I, I think the systematic approach and them getting in the groove of the pattern of doing it over and over is important. And then uh, in terms of if you are speaking about um, longer lasting things, it, I think a super, super good question. Um, and it has a lot to do with um, uh, doing it so often and making sure you're training with good technique so that you're not defaulting back to a compensation pattern. If you have somebody with a chronically tight hip and you do a lot of good work and you, their hip mobility changes but then they're arching their back on their split leaps and just using their back but never using the range of motion they've gained in their, uh, you know, whatever mobility work you're doing. And uh, I definitely posted some stuff on that if you backtrack in the, in the blog on the hybrid perspective. There's a couple really good hip performance complexes that we're going to talk a lot about more in the seminars. But there's a lot to it, you know, making sure it it sticks with uh, skill work, making sure they're consistent about it. You know, unfortunately, despite uh, I think be, being uh, more involved in the gym, I, I give the girls things. I'm like, you should do this every day. It's really important. And, you know, sometimes their decision to be consistent and really apply themselves to it is maybe uh, not all there. So I think there's some commitment about there. And <laughs> uh, so there's a lot to it, but technique's a big one, consistency is a big one. Uh, using the movement pattern is really good, and then getting uh, you know strong in that new range of motion is really important. Teaching your brain how to use that motion and be sa uh, safe and comfortable in it is really important. And as they grow, making sure that you frequently head back to like the F FMS or, or SFMA yeah. just to recheck what's movement going on. Movement changes all the time. Yep, and especially with you know we see a lot of girls that are in their nine to thirteen year old range in gymnastics, and that's just when they're they're growing like weeds. So they're yeah, always exactly. going to be changing those patterns. So that's something, Anna, that you can look at in order to, to incorporate some of the changes in there too. So the other question that she had kind of for a follow-up, and I love this one, and I've, I've never answered this one publicly, so I'm excited for this. Uh, she said, and what do you recommend for a 20-minute competition warm-up when you need more, um, when, when you do need more very specific skill routine type activities incorporated. Here's my, I'm going on record as saying that the warm up for meets is a joke and that as a coach, this is my personal opinion. I can't speak for Dave. You guys should be getting there earlier and doing more of a, a warm up like we talked about, because why do you want to do anything different in practice or in a meet that you've been doing in practice? The body still needs that, that, to be able to adapt to what's going to happen to it. They need that breathing technique. They need to, especially when they're nervous, they need to make sure that they're neurologically functioning at their peak. And if you're changing it up on them on that day, I just think that that's a, a dangerous concept 
for your for your athlete as far as a performance enhancing type thing. So I would I would walk them through exactly what what you do in practice. Dave, uh, I agree. Um, I think I do understand from a coaching point of view how it is sometimes hard to implement, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. Uh, busy floor, you know, one lane for all your girls in a session. I understand that. Um, but I would say that for ours, the majority of what we do is, is mostly similar in a meet. Um, I usually see if the girls can just toss the cross ball on their bag and maybe do it before when they get there early. Um, definitely, like Josh said, try to get there a little bit earlier and make sure you can do some of that maybe pre-warm-up or phase one before you have to get out and run on the floor so that uh, I try to have the girls do most of that stuff before so when we hit the lanes, it just starts with the the neck rolls, the wrist rolls, the hip pulls and things like that. And that's all pretty much the same all the way through to the end. And then um, I guess that there is definitely some stuff that because of the confined space, like the, the rolling to splits, we have to change to be more straight up and down. We don't not do them, but some of the more stalder type movements, if we don't have to type on the floor, we'll uh, maybe move those towards a skill a skill oriented side. And we will definitely do um, most of our warm-up, if not all of it, that we do in our gym. And then we'll spend maybe an extra five minutes on their choreography warm-up, their uh, timers for skills, their leaps, their jumps, get some corrections from their coaches, uh, handstand basics, shaping, things like that. So we definitely do put a little bit more time. Because in the gym when we have uh, our warm-up, the last 10 minutes of our warm-up, that whole 30-minute chunk is basics anyways. So uh, in the meet situation, it's just instead of just doing basics only, we have them do their individual leap passes, jump passes, uh, timers for skills, maybe mental stats, arm routines, uh, visualization, all that stuff kind of goes towards the tailored end. So although I don't think we change it and remove a ton, I think we just kind of adapt it to a meet situation, I should say. is that I guess that's a good answer. No, that's really good. And then the other thing, too, is that she, she follows up with that is when they get backed up in a meet. And I'm not a coach, so I'm just kind of giving this from, from pure theory, whereas Dave's a coach, so you should probably listen to him a little bit more on this one <laughs> than me. But um, I, have a, um, I, I think someone, uh, Brian, again, Brian Picard, who is also a coach and owns a big team and follows a lot of this philosophy, uh, just makes his girls do it. You know, even if they're backed up, if they're sitting yep. for a long time on their floor rotation, like, so they bump in from beam and they do it, whatever, and then they're waiting to go or they're waiting for their turn. He has them go off in a separate corner and do some stuff before their their routine or maybe two or three people in depth. Like they'll do some dynamic, uh, you know, kicks or some, uh, you know, pike stretches or some some elbow to instep is his like favorite exercise ever for, for a good reason. It's awesome. But um, he has them do that, like go off a little bit and instead of just sitting there cold turkey, they'll go over, do a mental set, do some more dynamic stretches, maybe, you know, get some things in and then go back and be ready to go, you know, mentally focused for the routine. So although it is really hard, maybe space confined, there probably is some space where you could just stay in a little two by two square and, do some dynamic work and stance or, or with somebody helping you out. So I think there's a way to do it. It is hard, don't get me wrong, because we've had this similar situation. But the last thing you want to do is, is get them all ready to go and have them be cold and then have to perform. Yeah, and that's what that's what I love about Brian is he is hardcore, but he does it, you know, like you said, no matter what, because it's the right thing to do. So he does it. <laughs> it doesn't matter if, if you know, the, the cool gyms over there making fun of you, he's still going to warm up his girls because he knows that's where performance comes from and protection right. comes from. And his daughter's on the team, and she says it looks crazy too, but he doesn't care. <laughs> yep, <laughs> which is awesome. That's the way it should be because we're here to, you know, the, we got to remember the number one thing we have to do for these athletes is we have to protect them first. And then we can talk about the other stuff. But part of protecting athletes, like we talked about before, is is warming them up and making sure that they stay warmed up throughout the meet. So right. if they do have a 20 minute downtime and sometimes it's cold during meat season, you yeah. got to get the body warm back up. So, yeah. all right. So here we go. Let's, uh, let's go down here to a couple more. So, so here's a, here's a good one. This one's more, um, yeah, Michelle just says, so, so you do the same stuff at meets. Yeah. That's what I always recommend to my, my athletes. And I think you kind of hit on that, Dave. So, um, yeah. Another one was uh, this from Lauren. She just said she's starting up a trampoline park, which that's some that's some some fun, I guess, going on there. And uh, we're starting a fitness class. What are some good exercises to warm up the body without stressing the joints? And this might be a great question for gym for gymnastics coaches when they're doing a light day. So what can they do to kind of warm up before they're if they're not doing a lot of punching and things like that? They're working more on dance and 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 other things. What would you do, Dave, for that, for not a lot of stress to their joints? 
Yep, so I would, uh, again, I don't know if I would deviate a ton from the, the one we already have. Maybe you take out towards the ending, like in our basic section, take out the, the punching, the round-offs, the plyos, things like that, or in her case, maybe not as much, like, you know, uh, impact-based activities. But uh, on, so in our, in our tapered schedule, we map out kind of like uh, our training volume and our flow is that we usually have a couple hard days followed by a light day. And on the later days, we focus more on the recovery work, the control work, the uh, you know technique work, the drills, the things like that. So for the coaches out there, I think um, the time that would maybe be dedicated towards plyos and jumping and bounders and things like that, you can do uh, a ton, a ton, a ton of really good uh, motor control drills and, and slow, you know, uh, I guess active flexibility is how people term that a lot in the gymnastics world. I call it motor control work. Um, you know, that's a really good opportunity because you're not going to be pounding and jumping, but you can still teach the hip and the shoulder and the core to integrate and function and all that. But in your case with the trampoline uh, park, I don't know. Um, I think you could still do a lot of the same kind of dynamic warm up activities that wouldn't really, those aren't really stressing the joints. And then I guess before you would go and uh, warm them up, I guess if you're on the trampolines, maybe starting with a little bit lower impact, lighter jumping, maybe some uh, more smaller maneuvers before you work your way all the way to, I guess, whatever your workout or hard stuff would be. You know, I don't know if you have to go. I guess I don't really know the situation, but I would say anything you can do to slowly ramp the system up and then slowly start to do more plyometric work and save your heavier stuff for the end once they've really hit a good body temperature and they're feeling you know, ready neurologically, I think is important. So uh, you can write back, but I think that helps out. <laughs> yeah, great. All right, so we have any more questions out there? Or Dave, you got anything else that you, wanna, you want to um, let us know about? Um, I think I just want to thank everybody for... Uh, taking the time on an hour on their Thursday night to, to come hang out wherever you are. I, I didn't even know we had people from New Zealand. That's pretty sweet or Australia. Um, so I guess just thank you because I, I'm, I'm really an advocate for continuing education. And, and as a coach, definitely, uh, you know, trying to always learn more about our, our, our training philosophies and our rationale for what we're doing and trying to really dig in and explore about, you know, what things are working really well, what things maybe we need to revisit. And really the only way that I've become more, uh, I guess more in tune with some of these concepts is just talking to people, learning more, being open-minded and just trial and error, try some things that work, try not to do it. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just think anybody who's here is definitely dedicated to wanting to learn more. And that's, that's how I think the best way to operate is. So hands down, hands, hand clap to you as well. Absolutely. And thank you guys for joining us here for the, for the webinar on warming up your gymnast. And so make sure that you, one more question, Josh. there's one more question. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, how about girls that train two times a day? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you very much. I, I saw that one and then I meant to go back to it. So thanks for sending that again. And this is, uh, this is, this is a big one because that's usually your higher level girls that are training two times a day that are putting their bodies under a lot of stress. And hopefully it's not at a super young age that we're doing this, but hopefully we're talking about more of the advanced ages and, and levels. But, um, but definitely it, it also depends on what you're going to be doing for that practice. So if, if it's, you know, morning practice is more of a, a workout practice and then afternoons is more of a, of a, you know, more traditional gymnastics practice, then you may want to do a little bit different in the morning and then do more of this warm up in the afternoon. So, um, but you always have to, to increase the body temperature if they're going to be doing physical activity, like we talked about before, and you have to neurologically prepare their body for what's going to happen. So if they're not going to be doing a lot of punching, you know, you don't probably have to do a lot of that, but if they're going to be doing, you know, more weight workouts like Dave and I have talked about in the past and, and things like that in the morning, then you want to do just a dynamic warm up That's going to address those things. Uh, that's yeah. kind of my opinion on it, Dave. Uh, no, I agree. Definitely, definitely still needs to happen uh, in yeah. some way, shape or form. You want to like we kind of talked about with the meet one tailor, it may be around like Josh, you mentioned too, uh, kind of where they're going when they're training practice, whether they're going to be more just doing skill work and um, more of their typical gymnastics work than you want to go full. But if they're just going to be doing conditioning, uh, maybe some mobility work or technique training or drills, I mean, maybe you don't have to go as in depth to how much you progress them with the, with the basics and what we're But I still think the fundamental concepts of, uh, of just the basics is really important because everybody has a baseline capacity they need to move as a human you know you need to be able to do certain movements squat you know and hips move this way shoulders move this way so I think that maintaining that constant level of you know basic function with this through your patterns or through your your skill work or through your um, 
just joints moving and coordinating well. I guess those are all just kind of fundamental to anything we do as humans in, in any sport. And then from there, you can deviate based on what your training is kind of focused for more regularly. Yep. And I, I like that a lot. And just the other thing, too, is making sure that your athletes, if they're going two times a day, that they have the energy capacity to make yeah. it that long. Fuel man, nutrition, hydration. Yeah, that's such a big deal. So especially, I know um, when I was in Washington, there were some girls that were that were eight nine doing you know thirty six forty hours a week, and that's just it's just so much stress on their little bodies that they're just not. You you do have those that have the potential to make it somewhat in that because they're genetically gifted, but for many of the athletes they're not going to be able to put up with that type of training load on their bodies at that young of an age. So just make sure that their bodies can handle it. And it's not more of a, you know, how many people can we get in and maybe get one or two out of it. So that's just my, my opinion on that. But the, but the nutrition load is, is, is humongous on those little girls that are practicing two times a day. So make sure that they're getting more than enough nutrition so that they can recover and get back into it. So, and that's one of my big things is nutrition yeah. for gymnasts. So <laughs> that's what Absolutely. I always go back to. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited to hear you talk about nutrition at the seminar. I think I'm just going <laughs> to sit back and record and have a clinic on my own to learn. <laughs> I love talking about nutrition just because I've seen so many of these, of these young kids, you know, they're, they're done with gymnastics now and it could have been, you know, just eating for performance. If they would have done that, it just would have been taking care of a, a lot of that. And then, and then the stuff that we've learned over just movement and how, how movement affects function and how pain affects function. Just that stuff that I know we've learned over the last year and a half, Dave, has just been, you know, if I could go back four years ago, it would, <laughs> we could have done a lot of good, but, but we're yeah. here now and we're, we're bringing it to you now. So I'm excited to do that. Definitely. So great. If there's no other questions, thank you guys for joining us. And, and once again, gymnastics revolution in the May first of, uh, first of June. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys. If you guys have any questions, you can always reach Dave at Dave at hybrid perspective.com. And you can reach me at doc doc at gymnastcare.com. And we'll, yep. you know, we're all, we take, I know for me, I get about five or six questions each day. And I know Dave has at least that many. So yeah, yeah, they're, they're always coming. I'm happy to help out. And yep. to Bo who asked, yes, this will, I think we're going to record this and put this somewhere so you can catch the first part of it. For sure. And it'll be on there. We'll have it up either on Facebook. Well, probably on Facebook, on Dave's site, on my site. So we'll have it everywhere so everybody can see it and get the most out of it. Because I think there's some good information that we brought that a lot of people don't necessarily get. So so make sure you too, if you're out there, make sure you share it with your friends too. Yeah. Your other Passing coaches out. and parents. So that'd help us out a lot. So if there's no other questions, thank you guys again for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time here on a webinar or at the Gymnastics Revolution. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.